Norman and I are going to talk separately. I'm going to give a little history of ARPANET, and uh, I mean ALOHANET, and it's due to ARPANET, of course. But I'm going to also talk about people, because you know most of you know about about uh, Aloha channels, but I don't think many of you, because you're so young, remember how it, how we started. So I think it's a good idea to start about it, and Norm will give you a lot more of the details of how we did it. Well, the reason we started was due to two things. One was the, uh, the development of packet radio, packet switching. It was done by two people, uh, uh, Donald Davies from England, and also Paul Barron uh, at Rand Corporation. They did it uh, simultaneously, but they didn't know that they, they did it each other. Okay. Uh, but uh, Donald Davies gave the name packet switching. And uh, it's an idea that uh, Larry Roberts at ARPA, it's ARPA in those days, not DARPA. Uh, Larry Roberts uh, got the idea and he ran with it. And he talked to Bob Taylor, who was his boss at that time at uh, ARPA IPTO. And they decided that they would develop a, a, a network, which eventually called ARPANET. And they used uh, BBN to develop it. And, and Bob Kahn, one of the major works of people there at BBN, did that. OK, with the, these two uh, projects, we decided we would also develop a, a packet switching network, but we would use radio also. And uh, so, oh, we'd use radio also. So th that was the idea. And then Norm came up with the idea, why don't we try to use um, random access? instead of, say, CDMA, which was rather too difficult at that time. And so we, and the other principal uh, professors there was uh, Wes Peterson. And so the three of us talked a lot about how to do that. And the idea was that Wes was working on, on um, uh, on time-sharing computer, and we were going to get a large time-sharing computer from uh, from uh, I IBM, and uh, the idea was how would the 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 consoles con uh, uh, get together with uh, get to the uh, to the um, 360, and uh, as as Bob could tell you that using the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Hawaii uh, radios, or uh, Hawaii uh, telephone system, was not the right thing to do. And so we're going to try to use radio. But then, you know, this is rather different from ARPANET, because they used landlines. So radio had very different uh, ch channel capabilities. And we talked a lot about that, and really Norm developed the idea himself, but with a lot of uh, our help too. Okay. So with that idea, we went to ARPA. And at that time, it was in the Pentagon. And this was 1968. And at that time, you could just walk into the Pentagon. There was no guards or, <laughs> or anybody else. And we just walked in and walked to the D-ring 
to see uh, Bob Taylor and uh, Larry Roberts. And we gave them the idea, and they liked the idea, but they didn't like us. <laughs> this is a, how can you develop a system that we were using BBN to, to develop, and you're only a, a handful of professors and students far away. It's almost impossible for, for, uh, for you to develop anything. So we spent some time trying to convince us that Norm and I would go separately to, our, to ARPA to try to do that. And finally, Larry Roberts thought about the idea of course, we'll, we'll use uh, radio and we'll use, use uh, Hawaii, but we also like you to take this big computer that we're going to develop called the BCC 500 to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to be a, able to connect to, 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 uh, to ARPA. And at that time, it's a big deal for, for computers to connect with each other at, uh, in, in, in the ARPANET. So we took BBC 500 with a lot of difficulties. And so we finally got a contract from, from, from ARPA. It was wonderful because Larry Roberts was the guy who really like the idea, and he helped us a lot in our in our theor theoretical work too, because he there was a man who r brought together the uh, uh, slotted aloha idea, and so uh, we got support from uh, both the Air Force and uh, and ARPA for a three uh, four, five year contract. And Bob and Norm and I were co-PIs separately. We, we would ch every year we would change. And at that time, uh, Norm w would go to, to Washington as Defense uh, Res uh, Communications Agency for a year. And I would, uh, I would go to uh, ONR London for a year. So we, we, we did a pretty good job together. And the idea of Aloha, the name, took some time because, uh, you know, but finally, uh, Wes, Wes Peterson uh, said, that, why don't we just call it Aloha? And, you know, and, and that stuck. And so the idea was that we would develop a packet radio, uh, a a packet network in Hawaii using radio. That, that was the whole principle to begin with. Okay, and so I would show you some of the early pictures of, uh, of the Aloha system. And what it does is what it has is what we call a mini huni, which is really the, the, uh, the the uh, ARPA uh, imp, but Minihuni is the Hawaiian name for, the, for an imp. And um, it's, it, nowadays it would be called, called uh, router or routers. But the, the, in those days, the Minihuni really took the, the data message and then, then packetized it and then sent it to the, to the, to the uh, to the radio. And that the console at the end should have a radio system called a DCU, uh, which sends back the information back. So you can see that we have two channels. One is transfer and trans transmitted, and the other one was received. And the Manihuni really, we 
followed a lot of the ideas you, uh, Bob, Bob, Bob Kahn and others from BBN, but we had to develop everything ourselves. And uh, we did it with really three or four graduate students, really great, and two engineers whose names I will give. And one of the graduate students, one of them most important is uh, Richard Binder, who is here today. And he'll talk about uh, how he did. Yeah. Well, uh, and, uh, oh, Menihuni, okay. The Menihuni's work was, was in one, one of the, the, the two engineers we had. One was uh, Alan, Alan Okinaka, and he was one of my students uh, as an as a undergraduate student. And uh, he developed and worked and developed um, the Manihuni, which is a very important thing. Consider that with uh, what ARPA did with BBN, with so many illustrious engineers developing their imp. imp. So it's, it's a difference uh, between how they did it and we did it. What we did was a crummy system, but it worked. <laughs> and we used the early HP 202115 uh, as a, as a as a mini, mini computer. And really, the development of mini computers was the important thing that both ARPANET and we, Alohanet, had to, had to worry, work with. Without the mini computer, I don't think ARPANET would, would have existed. So, you know, it's a confluence of different things. Packet switching, uh, many computers and some great minds. So th that's the many. And the other one is the, oh, you know, I'm an old guy, so I don't know how to go backwards and forwards anymore. <laughs> in, a re in a retirement home where I lived, you know, uh, we walked Back for, backwards and forwards every day for dinner and lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, don't, we don't think about computers anymore. <laughs> okay. And then the other system that's very ne necessary is the so-called TCU, the terminal control system that can every con, 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 uh, console or every terminal have to have a DC uh, a CDU, which uh, uh, which is a has a radio and has other things to do packet switching, to do packeting, and uh, it was a hardware system to begin with. But then when Intel came up with a 2008, we started an, another system called a PCU, which is programmable system. And Norma is going to talk more about that. And so the three, uh, the, both the TCU and the PCU, was was uh, developed by Alan Okinaka, but Chris Harrison came back. He's a, either an undergraduate or a graduate student. I don't remember. Uh, developed the PC, the PCU, and he could have done a lot more. But you know, it was uh, at that time. It was it was quite uh, quite an impressive thing. So this is what the TCU looks like. It's a it's a, a simple box to, to the to the console, and we have a lot of uh, ladies who are using it at that time. 
And Norm has other pictures of this same lady. I don't even remember her name anymore. Evelyn. Evelyn, okay. <laughs> and the other part of the, the thing was, was that we needed a radio. And the, the development of the radio was uh, David Wax, was the other engineer. What? What's, what's going on? Yeah, we've got a small radio problem. Here, let's see. Let's try that. Okay. And, uh, and when David Wax was also the principal guy. Sorry, Frank, it's, it's still not working. I'm not sure what has happened. Maybe, uh, all yeah, right. We have a hand. Uh, we wanted the David to come here. Now, I don't know if he came. No? Well, anyway, uh, he could have talked more about it. It's really a, 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 a conventional radio. Okay. He had the same problem in Aloha. Anyway, I talked about Richard Bender as being uh, such an important uh, person in developing nope. the software. The and uh, again, AV system just compared to Richard Bender with all of the people at BGN no, developing ARPANET to, uh, to begin with, you know, it's really quite remarkable. Three, uh, work. wow, totally work. full time. Richard Binder was a was a, uh, was a graduate student, and after he got his master's, BGN decided that we'd like to get him. So, so he they moved he moved to, to, to BDN afterwards. Well, he's here, and he also later worked for for uh, Bob Clanton directly. Well, uh, let me show you. The next project was, was a satellite link. And this is the time that uh, Larry Roberts left and Bob Kahn came in to do the same work. And he, he actually helped us a lot in, in developing our, our system, uh, connecting Uh, uh, AlohaNet to, 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 to ARPANET. And thank you, Bob, for, for all of this, the, the help that, that we did. And he gave us uh, what they, uh, and a tip from, uh, from ARPA to, to connect that. So with the tip, we, we were able to connect to, to, uh, to ARPA. And uh, so we linked two networks, ARPANET and ALOHANET, through this system. And so this is one of the early connections to the internet. Nobody called it that, but it really was. And so it connected also the ARPANET to the BCC 500, which is a large computer system, a time-sharing system that would allow many users, like 500 users, to connect together. And that worked pretty well, but uh, 
I didn't have too much to do with it. Norm did not either. Okay. And this is, this is what the system looked like at the end, and the Minihuni would be the gateway to different systems. And it's IBM 360, not 340, it was a mistake, connected to, to the Minihuni, and on the other way, it's a radio channel to the different, different uh, the consoles. And the other side is a, is a uh, ARPA tip that connected to the BCC 500 to the ARPANET. But one of the big things that we, we were doing in the second uh, cons, uh, contract was uh, Norm spent a lot of time developing uh, our satellite link to different universities in different countries. And uh, so he was sort of like the, the Alo Aloha ambassador to, to Asian countries. And I'll show you a list of the, of the different connections that we made to the different universities in Japan, in Alaska, in uh, Sydney, and Korea. And uh, I didn't do too much work in, in that, but it was quite impressive that all of these universities and all of these countries wanted to connect to Aloha. So uh, Norm would probably can talk a little more about that. And finally, uh, we were t you're talking about Ethernet. Well, uh, I know the more details about Bob, uh, Bob Metcalf coming in. It was like 1972, and he really did not have a PhD thesis. Doing, uh, I think he started a PhD thesis and uh, his professor left or something like that. And so he got the idea about, uh, about Aloha, and he came to uh, Hawaii about three or four months in 1973. And he brought his wife with us, uh, with him, and uh, at the airport, we sent one of our ladies to, 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 bring, to come in and welcome them. And Bob had a Madcast's first wife said, uh, do you speak English? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess Bob did. <laughs> and so he learned about what we did. And then he went to Harvard and got his PhD thesis based upon some some uh, issues that he learned from, from Aloha uh, and eventually went to, to Park to, to develop the Ethernet. And uh, so he, uh, when he often gives speeches, he often uh, recur refers to Aloha as the original idea. So thank you, Bob, Bob Metcalf. And a number of our people learned about that, and one of them, Bob, uh, Charlie Bass, uh, who, who was Wes Peterson's student, uh, a PhD student, uh, founded a company called Ungerman Bass that, uh, you know, turned uh, and was sold to another company later, but he made billions of dollars with, uh, with that. And so finally, uh, and our, the ARPA contract ended around 1975. And 1976, uh, I was invited to go to the Office of Secretary of Defense for, for a couple of years uh, as a director of information systems. 
I joined them in 19, January 1976. But at that time, Dora and our children uh, are still in school, and so they couldn't come. So for the next six months, Bob Kahn invited me to stay at his house. He wasn't married at that time. And so uh, I, Bob, I really learned how, what a great man Bob Kahn was at that time. But he didn't know how to cook. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I did a lot of the cooking. Chinese cooking. Chinese cooking, right, right. And I learned, um, I, and uh, Vint came in about uh, August, July or August, and I learned, uh, I uh, became good friends with Vint at that time. So, thank you everyone, and I'm going to introduce to, to my colleague, and Norm Abramson. Okay, well, um, as you can see, this is a, a two cane uh, presentation session, and uh, uh, we'll try to get through. And I'm going to use the chair a little bit and, and uh, use this to stand up against, and hopefully that will uh, make this a bit more intellig intelligible. Uh, let's see the. Use of this is probably within my capabilities. Let's give it a try. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm going to go through uh, sort of a uh, top-down uh, discussion of uh, many of the topics that have come up already, in particular some of the stuff on uh, CDMA and uh, spread spectrum, and some of the stuff that uh, Frank uh, brought up uh, uh, dealing with the, the uh, people on the project. Um, I think both Frank and I would, would agree that we, uh, we owe an awful lot to uh, people like Wes Peterson, uh, who, who isn't with us anymore, and, uh, uh, and Larry Roberts at, at ARPA for getting uh, the network at uh, the University of Hawaii in operation and for, for di disseminating the basic ideas that uh, we, did, we developed and uh, got working at the university. Now, Frank and I, uh, arrived at the same time at the university, uh, back in uh, 1967. And I thought it would be helpful to start out by saying a little bit about what the university was like in, uh, in, 19, uh, in 1967 uh, when we arrived. Um, first of all, the location. Uh, we were a little far from our source of funding. Uh, 4,800 miles, almost 5,000 miles to Washington. and. Uh, it struck us, uh, I think both, uh, pretty quickly, that in addition to the connection to Washington, there was also uh, a connection to, in the other direction, into Tokyo. And I'll say a little bit about the support that we were able to uh, attract, uh, not only from Washington, which, we, which was uh, central to what we were doing, but also from uh, uh, NEC, in particular, in, in uh, Tokyo. The, uh, uh, the geography didn't change very much. The geography is uh, something I can, I can pick up from Google today. Uh, but uh, some other things changed. And uh, that was the connection of uh, computers and communications to Hawaii when we arrived. Um, this was a long time ago. This was 1967. Uh, well, now, what exactly does that mean? Well, it was until, what, about 1981. Uh, until we saw the first PC, the first uh, uh, personal computer. So this was, uh, what, uh, 14 years, 14 years before the first personal computer. And it was, uh, let's see, probably 16 years to the first cell, cellular telephone. So this was before cell phones. This was before personal computing. And it wasn't just a year or two before, it was a long, long time. Uh, we had an, an awful lot to think about uh, as to what we were going to do. But uh, the description that you see here, let's see, can I uh, point to things on here? Oops, nope, okay, I won't do that again. Um, the, uh, uh, the general description of what we had to work with was uh, uh, basically pretty primitive in terms of what we're interested in today. 
Now, the first thing I want to cover, and I'm not going to go through, uh, 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 I'll try not to uh, duplicate stuff which our previous speakers have gone through, but I, I would like to give a little bit of an overview quickly of the Aloha Channel, the Random Access Channel, RAC, uh, which we built for the first time in Aloha to connect different users to the central computing station, uh, central computer of the University of Hawaii. Uh, here you see a number of, um, uh, let's see, what did I do wrong last time? I won't, I won't try that again. Um, here you see a number of individual computers shown, uh, these little boxes on the right, representing people who wanted to connect something to the IBM 360 at the university's computing center. Well, the something was uh, also pretty primitive. In those days, the something was very typically, 90% of them, were teletype machines. Something I suspect looking around here, uh, not too many of you have seen. But these teletype machines were the input and the output for what we could get in and out of the computer in the 360 in those days. The time-sharing system was being built at that time by Wes Peterson, and that was all uh, pretty. Uh, uh, it, was, it was all uh, pretty much up in the air as we started this stuff. Now, when exactly did we start? Well, before we go into that, let me say a little bit about how the channel worked. What we wanted to do was connect all these little boxes on the right there um, with the central computer, and. Uh, we wanted to send packets from each of these boxes. And we could have, of course, just said, OK, well, let's just give a, a special uh, channel to every box. And uh, uh, we'll work just the way uh, wireless communication works everywhere else today, uh, today being 67. We thought about it, and we couldn't get very many channels, which meant we couldn't get very many boxes in operation. And uh, our uh, initial proposal to DARPA, to ARPA, was that we were going to talk about hundreds or thousands of individual boxes connected to the central computer at the university uh, computing center. Uh, how could we do that with, if we needed a separate channel for everybody? And uh, we couldn't think of a way. So what we decided to do instead was to use one channel. And now jumping to the solution to the problem, or from the problem, to use one channel, we would send individual packets from each of those individual users that you can see on the, in the middle there of the uh, slide. And each of these packets would be transmitted independently from each of these users, which sounded great. The problem is, occasionally, two users would want to send packets together. And if they did, what would happen is that there would be a collision of the packets that those users transmitted. Well, the collision <clears throat> meant that the packets weren't received at the central station. And if the packets weren't received at the central station, then uh, we don't have a network. Um, now, how do we handle the, the problem of individual uh, collisions and, and loss of packets? Well, the way we decided to do that within the Aloha network is we let the good packets go through. And when the good packet was uh, received at the computing center on the left, then a acknowledgment, a positive acknowledgment, was sent from the computing center back to the individual user. If the positive acknowledgment was not received, then the individual user would repeat the message and keep repeating the message until finally that user got through. And so here you see two repetitions of those two packets where initially they collided. And since the individual users transmitted at random with random delays, uh, in this case, the individual users did not interact, did not uh, uh, collide again, and uh, uh, the, the packets were properly received. Well, this is a simple idea. It's also true, and I'm not going to go through that, that it leads to a simple equation to give you a numerical measure of how this simple idea will operate. 
And that I'm going to skip the equation, but I'm going to give you the end of it, because at the end of it, we found that the maximum throughput of this not so complicated equation was 1 over 2e, or roughly 0.186, or 18%. Whoopee. Whoopee. That sounds awful. <laughs> it's, it is awful until you start comparing it with anything else. Because what this meant is that you could, we well, really couldn't do 18%. You could only do something approaching 18%, say maybe 10%. So we would be able to transmit at perhaps 10% of the throughput capacity of the channel and get the information through. Why did it work? Why was it so useful? The reason it was so useful is that each of the individual users would rarely send a packet. The computer was working in milliseconds and microseconds. The individual users were taking about a 10 second interval to type on a teletype machine some uh, uh, a few characters, and the disparity between the slowness of the users and the, the speed of the computer allowed us to put a practical system in operation. So this is essentially the one slide of the random access Aloha channel. That's all there is to it. Um, let's take a look at what we did with the Aloha channel. Well, we built a network. And the network, here's the Aloha channel, the RAC, but the network is not the channel. And I want to bring this very common, very simple idea up right away because it's the, it's the basis of a lot of misconception about how networks operate. We put together an efficient random access channel for the first time. The two things that were the major contribution of the uh, uh, Aloha network is, um, were first of all the, the new channel, this random access channel, and secondly, the um, use of radio communications for computers. So to nail down what the contribution of Aloha was in 19, well not 1967, by the time we built it, it was 1972 or 1971. Um, to the contribution of that project was, first of all, the, the first use of radio communications in and out of a computer, something which is so common today. But the first packets in and out of a computer were transmitted in Honolulu and uh, consisted of the, uh, the data within the Aloha network. The uh, second contribution that we made was the format of the random access channel. The use of transmitting packets, hoping that they would get through, and then if they didn't get through, repeating them. Something as simple as that. Uh, but that particular protocol is enough for any of the operations that we all do today when we pull a cell phone out of our pocket and send a packet uh, to uh, uh, any particular destination. Now, we still have, though, the uh, random access channel, and we don't have a network. To make the network complete, what we need is to add something to the random, random access channel, and that is just a TDM channel, a time division channel, uh, where you can transmit which had been uh, data which had been transmitted on wires and using time division, for, I suppose, decades before we used it. And we used it to transmit data from the left to the right in the opposite direction rather than from the right to the left. So the data was transmitted from the users right to left and transmitted back to the users from left to right here. The, um, the Aloha network, um, let's just bring up the next part. The Aloha network architecture is shown here. This is finally a network. We finally got to a network rather than just a channel. The network allows us to transmit and receive data in uh, the Aloha network. And this is all that we had to build. This was the complete Aloha network completely in operation 
uh, transmitting packets back and forth for individual users. Sure. This is T actually we did use TDM in the other direction, and this is time division multiplexing. But it is, is different from most time division multiplexing in, in the characteristic that you described, Bob. It, uh, it transmits time, by time division multiplexing, but the time divisions are randomly selected by the individual users <laughs> rather than selected by the designer of the network. It may not be what most people think, but it's the way it works. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Yeah. We wouldn't have had that limitation, absolutely. And the channel would have been much more efficiently used, right? But it would be used to send data that you didn't want when you didn't want it. <laughs> to get data that you want when you want it is much more difficult. And that's what the Aloha channel does. Um, Yep. And guess and, and before you leave that thought though, because it's important, uh, you, you're talking about your your reservation your little reservation channel reserves a time slot and you can arrange everything, and that is used sometimes. Um, the, the problem is that uh, guess how that reserv that uh, reservation channel works. The, it uses an Aloha channel to, to operate. So it, it's sort of like a. You can, you can twist one way or the other to get a system that works, but each time you do, you find that the, um, the, for this kind of operation, the Aloha channel will solve the problems, and the 10% efficiency um, number that you can calculate with the theory turns out to be not a very important, um, um, we want to say this, that it turns out not to be, it's, it's a number that you can calculate nicely from an equation. And, uh, and as the one who, who derived the equation, uh, I'm very attached to it. The thing is, <laughs> it also has a problem. And it has a problem because what you're doing is saying that I can transmit at 10% of the bandwidth of the channel. In other words, you're using bandwidth inefficiently. Terrible thing to do, especially for FCC people. But um, what happens if you have a system where you want to transmit data, and you're not too concerned about the bandwidth? You go up into higher frequencies, there's a lot more bandwidth there. And uh, say you then have a, uh, a network that you'd like to build, either in two cases, one by satellite, and the other by a, pack, by a, 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 a mobile phone. Those two applications have an interesting constraint in them, which is different from the constraint in the beautiful equation that I derived. Um, the constraint there is a power constraint. You don't have, see, in, on, a, uh, uh, on a terminal, uh, as I described earlier, you plug into the wall, and you're not too concerned about the power. But if you're carrying something, and all your power is in, or your energy is in your battery in your pocket, or in orbit up there, your concern is energy and power. At the end of my talk, I'm going to show you that there are other ways to evaluate how, it, how well the channel works. And the 10% thing is a bit of a, um, uh, a false guide. Uh, it's a guide that we used very successfully to make a, an operating system, but there are also important situations, the satellite situation and the mobile phone situation, where the constraint is, a, is, a peak power, is an average power constraint rather than uh, an average bandwidth constraint.
Now, the, the arrival process is not, usually not at all uh, Poisson. But not where you're interested in it. It's Poisson with something added onto it because of the repetitions. That's the formula, and that's the assumption that you make. Um, but there's a difference between a model and the real world, and, and we should, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the, the, the difference between the two. Let's, let's go on in this one for a, a little bit, though. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm just trying to uh, figure out how much time I have left. And, uh, I, um, where, where were we? Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to, I feel I'm, I'm going to go into, uh, I'm going I'm to do another 15 minutes if that's okay. Uh, I hope I've only done 15 minutes so far. <laughs> okay. Um, but I won't, I won't go over that 15 minutes. Look, um, the uh, Aloha network then is shown here. The, um, let's see, the network architecture is, is a key aspect of how you, how you deal with networks, which is why some of your questions are really re relevant at this point. Uh, uh, you, you want to talk about the architecture of the network. This is not at all uh, a network architecture um, similar to the ARPANET architecture where you have a uh, general network and uh, you have to worry about routing and other problems. There are no routing problems here. Uh, the other thing that we want to look at, though, to analyze how to deal with these, these channels is, uh, the, and the only other thing that, that is equally significant, is the question of traffic statistics. Uh, the traffic statistics are important for the design of the channel quite clearly because if the total traffic going from uh, right to left, from the terminals to the central computer, uh, exceeds what the uh, uh, exceeds the the, the uh, capacity of the channel, whether it's 10 percent or 100 percent of the use of the channel, um, determines how useful this kind of a um, this kind of a uh, uh, formulation of the problem will be. In this case, it's very useful. It's very useful precisely because people don't want to send very much information to computers. They want to receive information from computers, lots of it. And there's a tremendous disparity between the amount of information coming at a person in most well-designed networks than going from the person. You want to just make a selection. You want to send a small number of bits and see what comes back, and that's why Google <laughs> has worked. Uh, the, uh, let's keep going on here. Let me just show a few shots of the uh, terminals that, that uh, Frank was talking about. I think this is one of the, uh, the, terminal, the, one, the, the photo that he used. I, I'm going to show you a sequence of four photos like this. And I want you to take a look at several items in these photos and compare them. First of all is the box itself. I'm going to show you the inside of the box a little bit, then we'll take a look at the subsequent boxes that have been built. That's the TCU, or later on the PCU, the Programmable Control Unit. Uh, notice the person who's uh, sitting at the terminal, and the, the modern terminal that you see there. Terminals uh, change very quickly from the teletype machines, which were available when Frank and I arrived in Hawaii, to uh, something much closer to what we would use today. So that's, that's a bit of technology that, that arrived very rapidly. Uh, let's take a look first at the inside of the box. Here's the inside of the box. Uh, an awful lot of chips. It looks like a complicated system. But this system was built before the introduction of the uh, of, of the microprocessor. Around this time, around 1971, a new company uh, called Intel came out with some interesting microprocessors, the 404, 404, and then the 8008, which we used to build a new box. So instead of the box that you see here, we had a box which looked like this a programmable control unit in a period of two years. 
In two years, we had gone down from that big box to that little one over there. Furthermore, the little box was not a terminal control unit. Notice the P there. It was a programmable control unit. Because it was built using a microprocessor, you could program the, the, the protocols in the system. You could program all sorts of parameters and all sorts of experiments with the system. And that kind of programming um, uh, was very useful, which I think uh, Dick uh, um, will tell us a little bit about later. Dick will be giving the next talk on this. He'll be talking about those, among other things, I guess. And uh, uh, this, was the, uh, uh, this was the state of the system in 73. Now, in 74, the major funding from, from ARPA to the university uh, came to an end. And uh, we weren't going to be able to build uh, new smaller boxes, it's clear. And uh, the new smaller boxes uh, that we uh, would have to build were something we gave a little thought to. Uh, we knew we wouldn't be building it, but we were wondering what it was going to look like in a few years. And what I want to show you is my guess in, I think it was 1974, 1976 perhaps, maybe three years later, uh, just three years later, of where this was all going. And I want to do this because I want to talk about how one predicts technology and uh, what we did in Aloha. Um, what would the next box be if we could build it? Well, three years later, here's my guess. Okay, there's the guess, and the guess is pretty, it's a pretty good guess. It's even the right size of what we use today with one major difference between what we have an antenna, right. And what was, why did I guess wrong in the antenna? Because I did not have confidence in the FCC ever reallocating a sensible set of frequencies for using data. And I apologize to the FCC. They did much better than I, would have, than I did expect in those days. And uh, we don't need a big antenna sticking out of our PCs. But, but this is basically, uh, I'd say, a pretty good guess of what to expect. This was back in 76. And uh, uh, still, the, uh, the uh, personal computer was on the horizon, what, seven years or six years after that? And the uh, mobile phone was eight years in the future. So well before the mobile phone and the personal computer, uh, we were able to come up with this kind of a prediction. That does look a lot like the Motorola brick. <laughs> oh, the, the, mobile, the Motorola IBM brick. The, oh, there was an IBM Motorola brick, too. The, uh, uh, the, the Motorola IBM brick is one I, we got a lot of fun with. It was um, Motorola and IBM got together and put um, put together a, a brick, uh, transmitting and receiving packets. And um, they did this before the frequencies were reallocated. So they had nowhere to go. But they did build the unit. They were using some inappropriate frequencies, and they gave these to all of their service people. So for a period in this time, um, about a five-year period, maybe more, IBM and Motorola were providing these basically bricks to all of their service people as their service people were, were dealing with customers. Um, let's finish this up by a, uh, an Aloha timeline. And uh, uh, let me, uh, what, I've, what I've indicated here is essentially the two, uh, the two uh, little uh, triangles there are the periods where we had more or less uh, ARPA and various DOD support. Um, the uh, support started uh, back around 69. I think it, initially it was not ARPA, but ARPA was very much involved uh, at that point. And uh, ARPA was involved until about the end of 74, and then there were other agencies that took up the slack. So essentially, we were building Aloha hardware between those two little triangles. We can quickly go through uh, the uh, various uh, 
um, uh, points that I want to mention. One is, there are just four of them. One is, we first essentially got a wireless random access network going uh, by the middle of 71. Um, the next major step was the uh, ARPA Aloha satellite connection. And I want to make a distinction because Bob has, uh, has brought this up. A and um, the, there, were, there were two kinds of satellite connections that you're going to see here. The first one was a relatively um, plain vanilla satellite channel. It was in the uh, Intelsat and the ComSat links. And uh, it's something that you could buy uh, and uh, uh, connect one piece of equipment, say, in Hawaii with another piece of equipment at uh, NASA Ames. And that's exactly what, what uh, ARPA did. And they put together a satellite 56 kilobit channel, which connected to the Aloha Menahuni. And with that, two things were achieved. The first time, there was a satellite connection. This was before the, the, uh, uh, the uh, Norwegian, I think, satellite connection, uh, connected to the ARPANET. And secondly, the, um, um, let's see, there, it, was, it was connected to the, uh, to the satellite. And secondly, it connected logically two separate networks. In other words, at point number two, you could reasonably state that we had an internet. Now, nobody had ever heard of an internet before, and nobody called this an internet. But as far as I can see, it was an internet. Uh, simply connecting the two networks, the, the uh, ARPANET and uh, uh, the ALOHANET. Uh, the third item was wireless sensors, which is also significant in terms of what we see today. Wireless sensors all over the place uh, are available, but what we did in those days, we, we put a, a small anemometer, anemometer uh, out on Mauna Kea, measuring the wind, velocity, and direction every, I think it was every 30 seconds, and, and uh, transmitted that back to the central station to build up a big database, which nobody wanted, of uh, the wind, velocity, and direction on Mauna Kea. Um, now, what was that? Well, that was the beginning of something else that we've all seen recently. I would call it an AOT, but others call it the IOT, uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, the Internet of Things um, began, at least the, the first thing on the Internet of Things was an anemometer that we had uh, on Mauna Kea uh, built uh, at the Aloha Network. And the final connection uh, was just uh, described by, by Frank, some of the uh, satellite random access connections. Finally, we had a satellite connection uh, before, but the satellite access connection, the random access connection, was installed finally at the end of 74. And we had, uh, see, the University of Hawaii, uh, NASA Ames Research Center, uh, University of Sydney, uh, Korean Institute of Science and Technology, uh, Denki Tsushin Daigaku in, in Tokyo, and uh, Tohoku University um, in uh, Sendai. Uh, I, yeah, I guess that's, that's the number that we had. Uh, let's see. I think we're pretty much through. What, what I'd like to finish with is a discussion of all of the applications that have come out of the Aloha Net, but I won't because I don't have another two hours. And uh, I'll just list them here. Certainly, Bob Metcalf and Ethernet uh, were uh, the, first, the first application that you could see. The uh, satellite networks that were put together in 1976 by Marisat showed a random access Aloha channel used for maritime communications. <coughs> the <moment. coughs> The mobile phones, uh, let me get some water here, were um, were uh, implemented in 82. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the mobile phones. Uh, then finally, Wi-Fi, of course, came out of the AlohaNet 
and the DOCSIS standards, uh, cable standards also came out of the, the internet. Let me quickly go through the ones that we have here for um, the AlohaNet, and that is um, the, one that I, the one application I want to talk about is Aloha in mobile phones. First generation, shown here. Um, from the very beginning, that is first generation mobile phones back in uh, the 1980s, used an Aloha channel from the very beginning. Uh, they used it where? Well, they used it in the request channel. In the request channel, the very first packet that they send and the very first packet that you send out of your mobile phone today is an Aloha packet. So in, in a way, and I think people have noticed this, um, all of our phones all around the world start off with Aloha. The uh, first generation was replaced in the 1990s by the second generation phones, and the request channel was incorporated directly into the second, gen second generation phones. But an additional uh, aspect of second generation phones were, the, were message service. So the small message standard was another introduction of Aloha into the mobile phone network. This phenomenon kept increasing. The mobile uh, small messages and the uh, request channel in the third generation were added. And then in, to, in addition to that, GPRS, basically a way of transmitting digital files for other applications, was incorporated into 3G networks. We're all here using 4G networks. And the 4G networks are, uh, uh, these were all uh, the Aloha applications within our phones. Uh, the various web applications that you see uh, in 4G networks, of course, many of those were also Aloha. And, and the question is, and it's a timely question, this is the first month where you can reasonably say, well, what about the fifth generation phones? They're starting to come out. Where do you see Aloha in the fifth generation phones? Well, in order to do that, I'll just move my slide over, the same slide, and add one more thing. Essentially, in the first month of the fifth generation slides, the thing that we notice uh, very, uh, um, very, that I notice very clearly, and, and I predict, this is why I wanted to say I'm a pretty good predictor um, before, uh, that we're going to see a lot more of this in fifth generation and further uh, mobile phones, and that is Spread Aloha. Spread Aloha deals with, it sounds like spread spectrum, it sounds like CDMA, and one way of talking about Spread Aloha is that it is CDMA, it's exactly CDMA without the CD, which many people have talked about up to now as being required to distinguish among different phones. The point is that you don't need CD in CDMA. If you simply use the same code for all of the users, it turns out you can get the equivalent operation and perhaps better operation of our phones. Uh, this has started very much in Europe where uh, uh, they have a standard called S uh, I'm sorry, E SSA, uh, Enhanced Spread Spectrum Aloha. Uh, that's being used in Europe right now for some of the initial um, uh, fifth generation telephones. And uh, uh, let's, let's watch this develop because uh, there are some, there are some uh, discrepancies between what is often, uh, how CDMA is often described and how CDMA really works. I think that's about it, and um, I guess uh, uh, there are some um, uh, next slides, but I think I'm going to slip that and just basically go to the end. Thank you. Let's see. I think I need a cane to get off here. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some 
very short time for a couple of questions, if there are any. Yeah. Okay, good idea. I'll sit, in, I'll, I'll sit down here if I can. Well, there's not actually a question, but a comment for Norm. Sure. Um, you know, you say that spread aloha is like CDMA, but without changing the codes. But the packet radio system that we deployed back in the 1970s had a CDMA system that did not change the codes. Great. So, uh, it, it, is, it was never described as a CDMA system, so I wasn't even aware that... that uh, we didn't use that term. What we yeah. called it was, you know, direct sequence. Wide, wide bandwidth. Direct sequence spread spectrum. That was the term. I think CDMA was a Qualcomm invention, or when they actually produced their commercial version of it, they started to call it CDMA. Maybe it even trademarked the, the term. So we weren't using that same term, but it means essentially the same with, thing. With, with only one code. We, that, makes, that makes a lot more sense. We used sense. only one code in the initial one because we, we weren't concerned about the security piece. We were trying to get the interference piece down. Okay. Um, the, the question, we can talk about this later though, Bob, but the question I, I would have is, was, were, were you using one code because you hadn't, hadn't finished building the system, or you wanted to make it bigger with more codes, or were you using one code because that's all that you really need? Well, it turned out for what we were doing, it's all we really needed. Good. But remember, okay. we were doing the spread spectrum detection using surface acoustic wave chips that came from Texas Instruments. And they were, and these were kind of chirp-like signals that they were decoding. Yeah, I remember that stuff. And it was the same chip that we were using over and over and over again. So it was the that's, that's inability one to get programmable mm -hmm. yes. detection these, chips. These days, you wouldn't do it as a, as a saw device. You would use it uh, within a, a faster computer. Not back then. We couldn't, we couldn't no, but in, in these do ways. So, let, Today, let's you would let's do it move to the next topic. I, I need to allow some Ramesh. So Ramesh Rao, UC San Diego, did my dissertation based on the work that you pioneered. But the question I had for you was, when you ran the system, did you ever run into unstable regions where the throughput would collapse? I don't think that we ever had, uh, uh, Frank, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I don't think we ever had enough terminals to <laughs> give us a, a, an, an unstable system. Uh, instability, remember, is when you have basically uh, something which is going to an infinite number of terminals. So in that sense, nobody has enough terminals. But we didn't even have enough to approach that. No, uh, not at all, because terminals were... We had about 20 at the maximum, sure. something like that. But was the channel dominated by collisions ever? Even if you uh, um, I would guess no. Um, we never, that's, that's a good question, and it was on our list of things to, uh, to investigate, but we just never got around to it. So with that, we will uh, thank our, our honorary uh, speakers and uh, move to the next session.